Hey guys, it's Hannah and this is Bookworms Talk. And today we're going to talk about Mudvayne by Taryn Fisher. This was released early. Of course it was released early and I finished this thing so fast. I went into it blind. I actually recommend going into this thing blind. So I'm going to give a super, super vague non-spoiler section if you're unfamiliar. I just turned orange. That's what happened with the Kindle, sorry. Now you guys see why I'm not tan. I would look horrible tan. As I was saying, I am going to give you a non-spoiler section. If you're unfamiliar with my channel, I give, I mean, it sounds like what it is. I give you non-spoilers about the book, which is like a very general, vague idea of what it's about without giving you like, hey, so this person dies at this point in book kind of spoilers. Not that this happens, I was just saying something random. I should start this off by saying that this is not a romance. Senna wakes up and she is caged. Not literally, kind of literally, sort of literally. But in order to find her freedom, she has to look into her past. All I will tell you is it is, it's a game. It's a sit game and only the truth will set her free. That's all I can say. I basically just read the synopsis on the back of the book and I don't do that. I recommend going into this thing so blind. Because our main character, I guess I will tell you this tidbit, uh, Senna, she is a writer, she's a novelist. And so she would say, oh, the characters that I've written, and then they would be nods to characters that Taryn had written in the past from the Love Me Fly series. And it was just like, oh, nod to, nod to for those of us who have read both. So it was a cool little thing. It's also nice to be a little bit familiar with Florence on the Machine. I'm so glad that I'm well versed with Florence on the Machine. I'm kind of have been obsessed for years. So I loved that I caught all those things. Like I said before, it's not a romance, but it's, it's still about love. Anyway, that is about the most jumbly non-spoiler section I've ever given as far as summaries go. So I'm going to jump into the spoiler section now, so come back when you have for the book and then discuss with me down there in the comments. So I'll see you guys later. Bye. First and foremost, I want to talk about the question. What happens when you put love to the test? I feel like that's a question that many people have had, but then for someone to actually think of a way to test that and then write a book about it, I mean, hats off to Taryn. And I really, really appreciated that it was more than just she was playing God, Saf Safria. I kind of just called her the dragon for the majority of the book. But I liked that it was more than she was just playing God because when you think about it, she was a therapist or a psychologist, psychiatrist, psychologist. I think psychologist is the one where they don't prescribe drugs to you. My point being that she came from a place of science and she would be someone who would think what happens when you put love to the test? And I so appreciated that. It was deeper than someone wanting to play God. I mean, how many horror movies have we seen where that's just our answer? They wanted to play God. So I really loved that. And I'm not really going in chronological order here, but I want to talk about the ending because that's what kept me up all night last night. We're left to play this what if game. What if the cancer wouldn't have spread to her bones if she wasn't kidnapped and she went in for those checkups? What if they caught it early and she lived longer, but then, what would that quality of life have been? And what if it just would have spread to her bones in time and her being kidnapped only accelerated the inevitable? And in a sick way, it did give them this second chance, her and Isaac, because they never would have had that. I love the clues that we got. I love the little bits that just gave me chills. Like when she first untied Isaac and she thought, why hadn't I been gagged and blindfolded with my arms tied to the posters of my bed? And he said, so you could free me. And it was just all a game. And then again with the thing and the, the, the well table, just, oh, it just, it was insane how thought out it was. The way that she described some things just, oh, they stick with me. I remember back in The Opportunist when she described Caleb's Drake as, um, Oh God, it was like smooth and hot like a jalapeno. I believe that was how it went. Something just so simple as describing a voice that is not so simple, but she makes it so, God, simply complex. I think there's even a part in there that says something about being simply complex. You need simplicity to create complexity. <gasps> yes, that perfectly explains what I couldn't just formulate with my own words. It's an octave above an alto, deep enough to lull you to sleep, lilting enough to keep you awake. Very seldom have I actually dedicated an ism to a character, but damn, has one ever deserved one like Isaac does? So yeah, it's an official thing. Isaacisms, he was really insightful. People have a need to feel connected to someone else. There is nothing wrong with that. There is also nothing wrong with being too burned to stay away from it. Oh man, so when she put together, it was the whole Bible thing. God is providing for them, their captor, their zookeeper is providing for them. And until they are tempted with the fruit, the keypad, they find their way out, 
Not that they can escape or anything, but until they find their way out, then they then have to, you know, fend for themselves, labor the land and all that stuff. So as long as they stay there and they don't try to get out, they'll be provided for. I mean, yeah, sick, right? But I'm sitting here going, I mean, smile on my face and I felt like a crazy person. But to think of that, I don't even know. That's just insane in a good way, kind of, I think. So they're trying to figure out why they're there and why he is there, really, because we're thinking maybe it's a fan, like an obsessed fan, which I kind of thought from the beginning that it's just, it's too simple. It's not personal enough. And I did actually manage to piece together who it was at about the 50, 60% mark. That is the only person that they both know. It made no sense for it to be Nick. And it wouldn't be her mother because it was too vague. She was the only person left that made sense. And so that's kind of, I put all my eggs in that basket and said, if it's not her, then I don't freaking know. But so they were trying to figure out why they were both there and what the connection was and the whole carousel thing. And then he was saying it was his wife. And I'm just like, oh, why his wife? But I love that we were misled. So then we get thrown back into the past. And this is my favorite part. So I really love seeing how they met. I mean, horrible circumstances because she went running in the forest and she was raped and she ran back out and um, he was there and he was going to run and, and he calls for help. And, but so that's how they met and then he offers to take her home. They end up living not that far from each other and he comes back and checks on her and he ends up being, you know, this stranger that sleeps on her couch to keep her demons at bay basically and just be there for her. I really loved the time that um, Isaac actually got her to go out of the house after all of this happened. And they went and watched the um, the gym goers go from the gym and the donut shop. And it was one of those that kind of reminded me of, um, oh my god, was it the ice cream shop? Just a little unique thing that it's not, we went out for dinner. We, it was something unique, special. And she wakes up with another nightmare of the man raping her. And she's screaming and hysterical and Isaac comes in there and he's restraining her but in a a comforting kind of way just trying to calm her and he told son about his red bike and how he prayed to god that it would have wings so that he could fly away in the morning but every morning it didn't and it didn't come the next day or the next or the next and then she had made an appointment with an oncologist before all of this happened and she found out she has breast cancer there was just one conversation, again, it's one of these Isaac-isms that I love so much. So Cinna accuses Isaac of having a fixation on death, and he responds with this. We all do, don't we? We are consumed with our own morality. Some people eat right and exercise to preserve their lives. Others drink and do drugs, daring fate to take theirs. And then there are floaters, the ones who try to ignore their morality altogether because they're afraid of it. I really don't know why I'm so hung on that so much. Then she decides to have a double mastectomy and she asks Isaac to do the surgery. He's a surgeon and he says, okay, on one condition, you, I want you to see a counselor. And then during one of those sessions, there's this, this, I love it. I discovered that private things were mostly sour. They sat spoiling in the corners of your heart for so long that by the time you acknowledged them, you were dealing with something rancid. I'm gonna say this, at the end, I did not shed a tear. I'm such a baby. I bawl over the smallest things, okay? Maybe it was that I anticipated this not having a happy ending, that I was prepared throughout this whole thing. They're going to die, they're going to die. One of them or both of them are going to die, and so I was mentally preparing myself. I don't know. But this part got me so bad. You have to remember, this is a past chapter. I know that she still lives, but yet I cried. I mean, it's not like I bawled, but... It was like a slow, steady stream of tears. So they were prepping for the surgery and she just began asking him questions. And she doesn't do that because then that shows that you give a damn. I really liked Nick's chapters that Isaac read to Senna after the surgery. They were uh, insightful. That's a good word for it. They had a couple really great things like, oh, you're a writer, so we speak the same language. And she was a house with no windows. You could go crazy in one of those. And then the mud vein quote that we got a teaser from, I believe. Now we're back to the Alaskan tundra here. And where we were just left off was when they pressed the date into the keypad. And now the landscape, I 
Florence Welsh or was it Florence and the Machine? I don't remember if it was just her or the entire band. Anyway, that's playing now. I mean, that's sad. That was a really scary full body chills moment of how did they know that song, which was one of the mixtapes. That was the first song on the mixtapes that he gave her. <laughs> That, I guess, I didn't really mention before, and I wanted to say that I really did love the mixtape thing. Oh my god. Because she didn't listen to words with the music, and then the white wall thing, and... <laughs> I love I have to mention that. And now that the door is open, they're going to have to fend for themselves. It's their punishment. But I love that Isaac thinks, okay, I'm gonna kill him. And I'm just like, thank you for the thought. Just that little thought. And then we have another beautiful, like, paragraph of Isaac where he says, You've been silent your whole life. You were silent when we met, silent when you suffered, silent when you kept, when life kept hitting you. Yeah, life kept hitting her and keeps hitting her. That is the most accurate description of her life. So Isaac tells Sunna that on the day that they met, on Christmas Day, when he found her running from the woods, that he had booked a flight to go see his family on the East Coast. But for whatever reason, he felt like... I just, I don't need to go and I, I'm going to go and I'm going to jog. And he goes on to say that life isn't random. I was supposed to be there and I am so on Isaac's side with this. I am a very big believer in fate. She's cooking dinner later and she puts the knife to her skin and he walks in on her like that and he's angry with her. It's not the first time that he's caught her doing this. So he forces her to then cut him to explain to her how it's like for him to see her do that. And then a week later, landscape stops playing and everything goes dark and the generator runs out and the sun finally goes down. And it wasn't coincidental, it was, it was planned. And time goes by and they've run out of food, they've run out of wood, they've chopped down all the trees, they've chopped up all the furniture, they've nothing left. And they bundled up together with the only little bit of firewood that they have left. I was quite sure that he would die because the faces of Mundane were all over Instagram. I'm thinking everyone loves this guy. He's so going to die. I don't think I could deal. She wakes up and Isaac is close to death and she's just thinking the table, the well, the table, the well. And she stumbles down there and she flips the table and she falls down into this well-like thing. But on that fall down, she breaks her leg and it is just the most uncomfortable thing. Yeah, I'm doing that dance thing where there's like bone protruding out of her leg and it is, oh, it's so bad. And the explanation for the table is really brilliant, by the way. The table from my book, I wrote about it metaphorically, the concept that all great things are made around the table. Relationships, plans for war. Then we get a flashback to the devil's backbone, which is the carousel thing, where Isaac says that he loves her. And, and then we finally get his tattoo, right? We understand it and it's the rope and it's wound around his waist and chest, looped around his neck like a noose. It wrapped twice around each bicep before coming to an end right above the words I've seen poking out underneath his sleeves. It was painful to look at, uncomfortable. I understood. I knew what it was like to be bound. And on the arms it said, die to save, save to die. A part of me had to die in order to save myself. So being a doctor was Isaac's only salvation. Oh, and I have to read this because it's so beautiful. She asks, what's the difference between the love of your life and a soulmate? One is a choice and one is not. There is a string that connects us that is not visible to the eye. Maybe every person has more than one soul they are connected to. And all over the world there are these invisible strings. Maybe the chances that you'll find each and every one of your soulmates is slim. But sometimes you're lucky enough to stumble across one. And you feel a tug. And it's not so much a choice to love them through their flaws and through your differences, but rather you love them without even trying. You love their flaws. And I love that she said that there's more than one soulmate because that totally supports this great idea thing from this wonderful movie called um, Before Sunset. And I'm sure the idea has arisen before that, but that is where I was introduced to it. Anyway, you should look that up. It's part of a series called Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before Midnight. You should really look it up. It's quite amazing. And on this carousel, which is completely empty, by the way, they have sex. And then the next day, without obvious reason, she files a restraining order against him. And a lot of us, I'm sure many, um, are thinking, why? This is actually when I piece it together. This is, this is the exact moment that I pieced Dragon Lady as Kidnapper Lady. Back when she was being counseled, she thought how I leave people before they can leave me. So Isaac sets her bone and it doesn't heal right. And it's just, uh, and, uh. Then there's this really wonderful part where we understand why she cut herself in the first place. And I think this explanation is quite important. I took the revenge I would never get in my flesh and blood life but it wasn't enough. It's never enough. So I took revenge on myself for allowing it to happen. She never told the police that he said 
pink zippo pink zippo she felt worthless and she didn't want to be near anyone who had worth and that's why she got rid of isaac and she told him goodbye so their zookeeper leaves a little present for them. It's a box with MV written in blood on it, and we open it and we find that there are just papers. And she puts them together and she reads them all. One of the piles is from her book, another of the piles is from her mother's book, and the other one is from Nick's book. Then after a few weeks, Isaac takes her cast off. And then they make love on that table, and she asks Isaac to tell him a lie, and he says, I don't love you. Then he says, tell me a truth. I don't know how, I breathe, then tell me a lie. I don't love you, I say. I just fell in love with this idea that a person could be a sense. I guess it's kind of like the synesthesia of it all. Then Isaac gets really sick and she doesn't know what to do. So there's this book that was left there that's his medical book, which makes absolutely no sense because he was a doctor in the house. Why do you need a medical book? Because it's all a game, right? Because it's planned and then it makes me think, well, how did he get the fever? Was that an on-purpose thing? How could you make someone get... I don't know. Let's just go with this. It's like fucking Jigsaw. And then she goes to the carousel room and she stares at the horse with the arrow in its heart and she says, give me what he needs. I'll do whatever you want. Just give me what he needs. And then checkmate. And she axes the hell out of that painting. And you know what's behind it? Of course cameras, because who thought of that? Who? Oh, is it just me? Just me. I don't know, maybe I've watched too many seasons of Big Brother. <laughs> so she goes to get snow to melt to give Isaac water, and that is when she sees their zookeeper. And surprise, surprise, it's Safria. And she says, you can send him back to his wife, maybe, but you have to stay. So she goes back to the house, and she injects herself with the serum. So Sina's remembering back now to her sessions with Safria, thinking, I should have known, like the pieces, they, it, it makes sense that it's her. And there's this one thing in particular, and it was one of those, oh, moments. Three things cannot be long hidden, the sun, the moon, and the truth. She takes her to a place where the sun is in the sky for so long, and where it's below the horizon again for so long. The helicopter comes, and Safria's in custody, and Isaac is safe. And when Senna goes and talks to Safria about her being in this institution, and how Isaac was the only one to get her to stop screaming, she remembers it. While she was in that institution, Safria took advantage of that position she had over Senna because that, that's, that's how she found out all of these little pieces of information. So that's how uh, it clicks. It all clicks. So Nick was waiting for her when she flew back to Seattle and she's basically outgrown the love of her life. And she accuses him that he only has writer's block and that's why he's only interested. She tells Nick that she had cancer but she has it again. This time it's stage four. Senna even gets a little closure with her mother. She doesn't read her mother's book, but she sets that part of her life to rest. So three months after she gets home, she goes to the hospital and she called ahead to see if Isaac was there. And he was. And Isaac says that he loves her and he has loved her since the moment she went out of the woods. How do you know that you love me? I was offered a way out. A way out of what? On the morning after we opened the door, I found a note in the shed with sleeping pills and a syringe. It said I could leave. All I had to do was put you to sleep, inject myself, and I would wake up at home. The stipulations were that I could never talk about you, not to the police, not to anyone. I had to tell them I had an emotional breakdown and run away. If I had told anyone about you, she said she would kill you. If I left you there, I could go home. I threw them over the side of the cliff. And this is where we get the question that started the whole experiment. She wanted to see what love would do if put to the test. Love doesn't leave, it bears all things. So she wants to go and see the world now. Her cancer is terminal and she knows that and she wants to see and experience everything while she can. And on the day she's scheduled to leave, she finds, just like old times, a CD tucked beneath her windshield wiper. And then she writes Isaac a letter and she writes about how she finally understands his tattoos. And she goes on to say, Every minute you spent getting to know me, I get to know me. Forgive me for not recognizing our soul likeness sooner, while we still had time. We are all going to die, but I'm going to die first. In the very last second of my life, I will think of you. I think I can safely say that that's one of my top, easily top favorites because it's so different. It asks a question that harbors such complexity, like how much is a human life worth? How can you answer something like that? Like how do you test love? Something so crazy as that and to then think of a way, it's genius. 
I just, I really admire the idea of it. I really admire the execution of it. It just hats off. I want to know what you guys thought of this in the comments. Tell me your favorite parts. So I will see you guys later next time on Bookworms Talk where I will have a discussion up on Rock Bottom by R.K. Lilly. I actually filmed that before this, but I'm so super excited about this one. So it's, it's going up first. So that will be the next one that you will see. First time I'm actually going out of order. That's how special this book is. So I will see you guys later. Bye.